pleasure, Ginger. Can everyone see the screen okay? I want to make sure that it's all uh, all visible. Yes. Excellent. Well, well, I want to thank uh, Professor Yu for an excellent summary. I think a really fascinating set of issues surrounding uh, intermediary liability. What I'd like to do is to give a couple of different um, results. The first of these is to see about possibly redefining the problems in such a way that it makes them somewhat easier to solve. It helps us design, come up with some design tools. The second is to actually show how it might be possible to intervene with uh, intermediary liability, to give it in such a way that we don't harm speech. So how is it we could be protective of uh, First Amendment rights or speech rights generally, but also then hold platforms accountable for the damage that they cause? And the third is perhaps the hardest one of all. Um, as first, you pointed out all the way back to Milton, I think it was in like 1644, has been this problem of who should regulate speech? And usually there's some kind of central governance mechanism, which is anathema to the regulation of speech. So is it possible to design decentralized mechanisms that would allow this to proceed? Could we create, if you would, markets in truth that are so totally decentralized, there's no single party, and therefore we would avoid some of the agency problems that we would normally have? One of my contentions is that we lack institutions to handle this because we have not recognized some of the externality issues in here. So I want to see if I can be clear about why I think that's the case, but let me take a quick look at what some of the current solutions to some of these intermediary liability, prob um, liability problems have been. To the best of my knowledge, this is a summary of all of the different solutions out there, whether it's crowds or algorithms, uh, you know, media literacy, educating consumers, truth chasers and improved discovery, demoting the feed, banning, uh, tagging and product labeling. Every single one of these suffers from at least one of the following problems. The technologies are all an arms race problem. Um, the second one is that if some individual or group is deciding, then the liar simply discredits the decider. If you can lie about the content, you're happy to lie about whoever's deciding. The third, I think, is subtler. Most of these solutions put the responsibility either on the platform or on the reader or listener rather than on the liar when it's the liar who, of course, knows that the uh, authentic, the uh, content is inauthentic and contains misinformation. So the responsibility is on the wrong foot. And the fourth one, um, which I believe is universal, not a single one of these solutions addresses the problem that it is cheaper to produce lies than it is to produce truth, that it is cheaper to produce you know, stuff that you just make up than honest journalism. So none of those solutions work. I like to assert that the problem needs to be conceived somewhat differently. Uh, most of this comes, comes down to, it's not just the fakeness that matters. To give you a couple of quick examples, is Pluto a planet? Is it an asteroid? Well, it hasn't actually affected anyone's life. Um, you know, or we've had various times thought the Earth was flat or that there were six planets versus nine. It hasn't really mattered. Another one, uh, I like this particular restaurant, Eat at Jay's and Lives Forever. Well, that's provably false, not only because you could check the science of it, but uh, post-COVID, Jay's um, is out of business, so they must not have eaten enough of their own food. Um, another one is that fake news that is disbelieved just isn't a problem. So that's not that's an issue. But there are plenty of occasions when true information does matter. Uh, when Russia used it to suppress black votes in the United States, uh, or misleading half-truths that are used to create a lie. There are plenty of anti-vax groups that point out, um, you know, here is a famous person, as Colin Powell, that took the vaccine and died of COVID uh, so that it must not have been effective, omitting the fact that he uh, had blood cancer. Um, so they, they uh, use partial truths, so they combine them in ways that actually create lives. Or true news that's disbelieved can be a problem. At its heart, law all law, whether it's Chinese or UK or American law, you can't own truth. You can't be dispossessed of truth. So in a sense, truth is not necessarily the great focus of law for mechanism design. What I assert is the issue, it's either decision error or externalities. If you look at the decision error externalities, you look at the loss of herd immunity from people not getting vaccinated or pizza parley shootings or uh, insurrections that are happening in the United States or in Brazil. You can be liable for decisions and you can be liable for externalities. What this means is that externality, this is why I think the problem has been so hard. Externalities cause market failures. Market failures require intervention, but government intervention is speech is expressly forbidden by the First Amendment. 
that makes this hard. That means that attempts by courts to turn this over to the marketplace of ideas will fail. The reason is markets do not self-correct market failures. The implications are there's too much pollution. People are not internalizing the harms, and so there's over there's overproduction of misinformation. That is one of the reasons why we might see it uh, so much since social networks have given, had made everyone into a journalist, and they're not internalizing their pollution costs. And of course, there's now too little correction because attempts by courts use marketplace of ideas don't work. And so the task is to internalize externalities and to decentralize intervention so that no one controls them. To the best of our knowledge, in economics, there are two and only two solutions to externality problems. They've been provided by Arthur Pigou and Ronald Coase. Um, and so there are two different ways of looking at it. Let's see if we can examine both of them and see if we can actually use those as design tools for the externalities. Uh, Paul Romer suggested possibly a progressive ad tax. The beauty of that is that it's not content-based. Um, it's also shifting the business model toward subscriptions, which would re reduce the invasions toward privacy. The challenge of that is because it's not content-based, it actually doesn't affect the nature of the harm. Uh, you could have a completely clean uh, ad-driven uh, system that paid a heavy tax uh, and also a subscription. Imagine Parler was completely subscription-based, causing all kinds of harm. It's just not the nature of the harm. So Pigou would focus the tax on the externalities and the way you could pass strict scrutiny um, you know, in the illegal would be to focus on illegal content, such as sex trafficking, incitement to violence, terrorist recruiting, or foreign election interference. Putin doesn't have a right to speak in uh, you know, American or Brazilian or European elections. And so governments would have a genuine interest in uh, backing that out. The other problems with these are twofold. Um, the first is that if you hold platforms liable, this intermediary liability, the worry is exactly as Professor you just described, there might be taking down too much speech. So you'd be hurting speech. So that would be a problem. The second one is scale. It turns out if we're clever about it and we recognize this is a pollution problem, we can address both of those issues exactly. Let's show how we could might possibly do that. The first of these is to recognize it as a pollution problem. We tackle this as a flow rate. You could hold platforms at intermediate, intermediate liability at a flow rate. The way you do this is statistical sampling. Do you want 80% accuracy, 90% accuracy, 99.9999? You just take a bigger sample. It doesn't matter if you uh, miss a few messages or you even get it wrong. You simply adjust your error bars based on the level of the flow rate and the size of the sample. And it easily adjusts to progressive rate. So you could have a pollution rate that's different for Facebook than for a startup. And this becomes a social dial that's easily weighted in different societies toward either greater information integrity or toward greater accuracy. Simply put, a doctor doesn't check all your blood to check cholesterol. He or she takes a statistically valid sample. We do the exact same thing here and hold the platforms liable simply for a sample. The second thing we do is we separate the original post from the amplified speech. Now, the interesting problem there is this. So that's this, we've just addressed the scale problem. How is it that we uh, hold the platforms accountable, but not hurt speech? Here's the issue. So the speaker provides the spark. This might be you know, something going on with the Bolsonaro election or the Trump's stolen election. But then the platform provides the amplification. We just heard about the Gonzalez versus Google case where the Google may be amplifying it. How do you hold one accountable without holding free speech accountable? What I want to do is to use the Shapley value. When you use a formula, we're going to separate the original from the amplification and show you what happens. So imagine the following scenario. A scientist creates an invention of value one, and the venture capitalist amplifies it a thousand times to build a business around it. The venture capitalist wants 1,000 over one plus a thousandth value of the share. Is that fair? Most people would say no. The Shapley value tells us what you want to do is to look at the indispensable part of it, and you give them their fair share of their indispensable portion of it. So for the first increment, the scientist is totally indispensable, and the VC irrelevant. So they get 100% of the one. For the second increment, 1,000, the scientist is indispensable and the VC is indispensable. So each gets half or 500. So the fair shares are 
one plus a 500 over one plus a thousand to the scientist and one 500 over one plus a thousand to the venture capitalist. So regardless of the amplification, it's easy to hold them accountable, whether it's a good or a bad. So if it's, if it's uh, multiplication or amplification, a thousand fold or 10,000 fold, or in Trump's case, 88 million fold, it's quite easy to hold them accountable. But now let me show you a little bit of economic magic. Notice that the damage in this case is 1,001. Suppose that we hold the platform accountable just for its share, which is only slightly over, slightly under half, 500 or one plus 1,000, okay? What happens? If that's true, it becomes unprofitable and they stop amplifying. Because the damage was jointly created for 1,000 units, the full 1,000 disappears because the amplification disappears. What this means is you can leave up the original spark, the free speech, but you reduce the amplification. So long as the ad you charge them at the ad price, lies become unprofitable to boost. And by the central limit theorem from statistics, this is highly predictable. So simply by charging the ad price for the pollution that they we should hold them accountable for, you may be able to get a highly predictable tool that leaves the first post up and thwarts the amplification so the thousand points of damage disappear. Let's turn to the second problem. And this is an ages old problem. How would we design a Cosian market? What is the property right or the missing market, the social cost and the essential nature of which is an intangible falsehood? Uh, I wanna point out by the way, these market designs are intended such that they could work in the US, in Europe, or in China. So these are not law dependent. What we wanna do is to go down to fundamental rights to see if we could rearticulate them in an interesting way. So how would we design this missing market? How would we trade in the externality in a pollution cost sense? We have to ask what information rights would be and how they could be violated. We also ask, for example, there's a phrase that's been circulating ever since this Section 2-3 reform has come up. You might have a right to speak. You don't have necessarily a right to amplification, as an example. Well, think of your rights of information seeking and your rights of information speaking. Let us suppose that individuals have a right to gather information from preferred sources based on criteria of their own choosing. That gives them each the ability to see and hear what they want. Note that this right to choose asserts an equal right not to choose, and therefore a right to hear and a right not to hear. Importantly, the free exercise of that right could lead to balkanization and filter bubbles as people choose to hear only what they choose to believe. The speaker's right is in simply a right to influence decisions that affect you. It also means in a counter speech sense, if some other speech is disagreeable, you'd like, you have the right to provide speech that is agreeable, to influence decisions. But this entails being heard. Notice at the extreme, the free exercise of this right can lead to lying and signal jamming as people seek private advantage or it's something at the expense of others. This necessarily leads to a conflict of rights. How does the right to he be heard balance the right to not be heard right, or not hear in these things? If we combine two different branches of economics, not just externality economics, but information economics with externality economics, we might come up with what I would call a Spence Coase market, signaling together with externality screening. So here's how it might work. Suppose that speakers are free to express themselves in any way they wish, facts or opinions, but a speaker gains a new right if they present facts. Notice facts are verifiable in ways that opinions are not. So a speaker gains a right to have factual claims heard even over listener objection by warranting that content is valid, meaning it is not illegal, so it doesn't pertain to tra sex trafficking, it's not incitement to violence, it's not stolen copyright, and it is not materially false. The election was stolen, uh, vaccines have microchips, or um, you know, the uh, Pope endorsed my candidate. It's a time limit warrant, such that, you know, backed up by any resource, 
either it could be social capital, such as followers or uh, reputation points, or it could be financial capital. And it must scale with the externality. This is the Cosian portion. The speaker doesn't determine it. It's determined by the size of the externality. So a larger audience would have a larger externality associated with it. Notice anyone may challenge legality or falsity by paying peer jury adjudication costs. If the challenger wins, they keep the warrant. If the speaker wins, they keep the warrant. Notice opinions cannot be warranted, so they cannot be imposed on others without their consent. In effect, what this does is it defines two different entitlements. Speakers have a right to have true claims heard, even over the objection of listeners, subject to liability if they're wrong. Alternatively, you can do this as listeners have a right to be free of false claims subject to liability protection. Let's show how this can reform U.S. law, but I believe this could be applied to law anywhere. What's really interesting about this is if you look at laws in the United States. One minute. Uh, we're going to run out of time, so I may run over by just a bit, Ginger. Um, thanks. So um, United States, <clears throat> if you do a print ad, you're live, if, you, if you post lies in print, you, this is a 1914 ad, um, and this goes to the New York Times' the Solomon case. Print is liable for lies in their advertisements. Broadcast is um, similarly liable for um, ads in their advertisements, except for political candidate ads. The reason it was assumed is that because broadcast licenses are fixed by the state, you had to get approval. And so um, broadcast must take candidates' ads, but in exchange, they don't have liability. And then on the internet, section 230, they have full discretion, but they're not liable at all. So we've got a full range on the far left where they're completely liable. On the far right, they're totally liable. And proposals have been to make them fair by introducing that legislation to reconcile it, perhaps on the broadcast standard. If you use this Spence Coast model, uh, you have a much better uh, solution. Take a look at the Tom Steyer problem, he wanted to advertise on Fox News, and they simply said no because it contravened their editorial policy. Pillow Guy, Mike Lindell, wanted to advertise on MSNBC, and they said no because they didn't like him. If you use this Spence Coase model, then it solves that problem. Tom Steyer could buy an ad on Fox. He simply has to warrant that it's true. Or Pillow Guy could buy an ad on uh, MSNBC. He simply has to warrant that it's true, in which case, you can get truth exposed to another audience, or you're liable for the falsehood. Um, what's what the benefit is that this creates socially optimal liability. Who should be responsible? Well, it's not the listener. It's so grossly socially inefficient. The party that authored it knows if it's true or not, and it's socially efficient to have the platform check it once when they receive payment, as opposed to the users, the 10,000 or a million of them, that don't receive payment. It's fair across all media. It puts the costs on the socially efficient party who can bear them, the least cost avoider. It maintains editorial discretion, um, except it gives the editorial discretion to the party with the liability. So it transfers the liability. In effect, it lets truth go up and polarization go down. You could use this for the Hunter Biden laptop story as a good illustration of this. Uh, most of you may know the Hunter Biden, New York Post published a story claiming that Hunter Biden had dropped off these laptops, uh, water damaged laptops at a blind Trump supporter repairman um, and then never picked them up again. Um, then his personal emails and pictures made it to Steve Bannon uh, and from there into the New York Post. Interestingly enough, one of the co-authors of the story didn't think it was credible and wouldn't put his name on it. You could use it. Ex now the conservatives and are complaining that they've been suppressed when Twitter and Facebook didn't do it. Um, but in, uh, didn't uh, disseminate it. Um, but what's interesting is, if New York Post thought it was credible, they simply have to warrant it, and um, then it could be spread. If they aren't warranting it, then Twitter and Facebook don't have to choose to spread it. Others don't have to, to listen to it. What's really interesting is, if they won't warrant it, then they don't believe it. And if they do warrant it, even Hunter Biden could challenge it and then uncover the private information. So it effectively solves the problem of decentralized adjudication of truth. And the party with the liability is the party in the best position to bear responsibility. We're running out of time, so I won't go through the full benefits of it. But this changes the cost structure problem because it makes lies more expensive than truth. It solves the arms race problem because it's not 
a technological solution. It's a human behavior problem. It puts responsibility on the least cost avoider, and it internalizes the externalities. Anyone can challenge it. In this case, it's not just New York Post to voters. Hunter Biden, who might have suffered the externality, could challenge it or anybody party. So it transfers the externality to the liar. It solves the discrediting the rater problem. And most importantly of all, it is a totally decentralized market mechanism that has no single party that adjudicates truth. So it's a mechanism of combining information economics with externality economics in a way that could be applied perhaps in any marketplace uh, as a way of trying to go after this particular problem. Um, for those that are interested, the paper is just available at the address below. It's free speech platforms and the fake news problem. And with that, I would love to hear any commentary because it's uh, it's just a first draft. Uh, looking forward to submitting it. So hope hope to hear uh, your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you.